Good morning. My name is James Osborne. I am the Director of Community Education and Outreach here at Alliance Health. I'd like to thank you for joining us today to talk about recovery and self-determination as we look at ways in which we can promote a recovery-oriented system of care. So who is Alliance Health? You may already know, but we are a behavioral health um, LME MCO. I'll spell out all the acronyms for you, a local management entity and also a managed care organization. Our local management entity functions relate to our state and county dollars that we oversee, uh, and the managed care function oversees the Medicaid dollars uh, that come to North Carolina, and we do this for four counties, Durham, Cumberland, Johnston, and Wake, and we're one of seven LME MCO such entities that are set up in the state that was part of the Medicaid reform process. Within our four county area, we have over um, 200,000 Medicaid recipients and the population of 1.7 million. And this is all part of the Medicaid waivers that were both the um, B part, which was related to mental health and substance use, and also um, 915C waiver, which was related to the innovations wa waiver for individuals with um, IDD, intellectual developmental disabilities. North Carolina um, has money that is set up to help individuals impacted by COVID-19. Um, Hope for North Carolina is the name of the FEMA grant that's been administered through the Department of Health and Human Services and the Department of Mental Health. Uh, and each of the LME MCOs um, of the seven in our state um, are then using this grant money to be able to help individuals find hope and find help. There's a 1-800 number that you can reach and there would be somebody that will be able to reach you 24-7. Um, so what are we going to talk about today? We're really going to have a very straightforward, open, honest, and direct conversation about recovery, um, about where we've been in the past, where we're at presently, and where we're at in the future. We're going to talk about Alliance commitment and also your commitment and our community's commitment to recovery. We're going to talk about what exactly is recovery and what are the tools and, and what can we do next. A little bit more about myself as I'm getting started is I, I am a psychologist, uh, licensed clinical addiction specialist that's been working in the field for 30 years. Also equally important, I have family members that have mental health and substance use conditions. I have worked on helping individuals find services and I've also tried to do that for my, uh, the individuals that I serve. I'm also a part of uh, NAMI, National Alliance on Mental Illness and their board. And so as I talk about recovery, I'll be talking about uh, how that has impacted my family members along with the people that I've tried to serve um, in, my, in my career. So there is a great deal of a national, international co um, conversation that's going on about uh, recovery and also self-determination. The term self-determination definition is looking at how individuals have the right to choose. It's used most frequently with individuals with intellectual developmental disabilities, but each of us have a right to choose, and this was part of the mental health reform that happened in the early 2000s as we moved out from our area programs and moved towards a uh, privatized system. There's a lot of research out there that are, is about uh, recovery, and so this is really not a new topic. What has gotten in the way of us being able to move forward in serving people with mental health and substance use disorders, and that's really the primary focus of the trainings around mental health and substance use disorders, has been fear. Fear, it could be an acronym that could stand for um, false evidence appearing real. Um, fear is primarily related to anxiety. Um, that also gets in the way of people finding uh, services. It can also be a positive word, uh, which could be, uh, again, face everything and recovery. So F-E-A-R could stand for uh, false evidence appearing real, or it could stand for face everything and recover. Uh, and, and fear is what it also impacts on uh, our stigma that really gets in the way of people being able to ask for help. Many people don't want to say that they have an issue. So in the past, there was no such thing as mental illness. It was only madness. Um, and there was the treatment that people got was indistinguishable, um, could not be, how do you pronounce that word? Indistinguishable. You could not figure out whether it was torture or murder. Those are very serious words. And if you look at the history of how we treated people with mental illness over the years, you will see how this um, is true. So we start looking at the, the beliefs that people have and how those beliefs then impacted their understanding. That then impacted the treatment and what people have had to endure. 
So going way back here, we start looking at uh, prehistoric times. We want to look at the, the causes on the left side. We want to look at what are those influences and beliefs and what are the understandings and the, and the treatments. So when we started out, we really thought that this was related to demons and evil spirits. Um, this is why people still today, you've heard them say that, right? They're, they're fighting the demons. Again, there was a belief that this was a punishment for sin, that there was something wrong with that individual. Uh, they weren't living a good life. You hear some of these things even today. And those things then translated into what was influencing it, which was really religion and not science. The treatments was really coming from shaman and witch doctors, depending on where you're at. And they also started using something called trepanning. Has everyone, anyone ever heard of trepanning? So what do, you, what do you think these instruments are used for? Well, they're used for trepanning. And again, at that time, people thought that there was something going on with the person's blood and that they needed to drill a hole in that person's head in order to let some demons out. This is where people talk about bad blood. This is why, uh, and so they really thought that there was something going on there and they needed to let the demons out from the person's um, head. The other thing that was unfortunate in these situations is that people, of course, ended up dying uh, because of the, uh, the results of these types of treatments. So let's talk about the Renaissance period. Um, and this would have been um, from the 1300s to the 1600s. And at this point, we've moved from uh, still within the um, evil spirits, but now we've moved into calling them witches. Also, during that time, we had a very male-dominated society, so of course, witches were females. Um, and this is also when, the, in the, talking about the influences, this is when we had um, the influence of the church was coming around, um, and there were um, monks and nuns. And so the monks were making up the rules that then, then prosecuted or um, had uh, discrimination against the females. We also had plagues that were going on within our society at that time. And again, they ended up believing that these plagues were a result of punishment. Many of you all can remember back also to, for example, um, Katrina uh, and the hurricane that hit um, Louisiana. Um, and it was also seen then that that could have been, again, a, a spiritual thing to deal with the uh, sins that were happening in that area. Um, and so people try to find reasons for why there is uh, natural disasters occurring. Um, this has also been used, for example, um, around HIV. And again, believing that diseases or these natural disasters are related to people's behaviors, and they're not. So as a result of this, we end up having a lot of witch hunts. Um, there was further um, bloodletting um, and uh, purgatives. It was an idea that there was something going on in the person's body, and they needed to get that out. Um, and, and so then we moved on to additional treatments, which is this. Any ideas what this is about? So at this time, they ended up thinking that what was, again, what was the problem here was uh, the blood. There was something in the blood, um, and so therefore we need to get the blood out of the body. And so they would actually uh, puncture the person and allow the blood to leak out. Um, and of course, as a result of that, people felt depleted, exhausted, um, and again, frequently died, um, but they were also very sedated if they were any, if, if they possibly could even recover from these types of uh, procedures. We moved into the 1800s, um, and, and so during this time, we still thought that there was um, some supernatural uh, issues going on, but we also were able to start looking at some physical causes. Um, and there was various influences here, again, usually um, linking to um, animals. And so we just, again, we used um, animal behavior as a way to predict uh, human behavior. And so this is when we um, started believing that we could swing people or shake madness out of them. This is also the time when we used uh, straight jackets, uh, tranquilizers, um, and cold baths. So what do you think this uh, chair was used for? Or how about this one? So the idea was is that somehow these people are overstimulated. We need to calm them down. And so by putting them into one of these mechanisms, we could therefore reduce their sensory input and therefore they would calm down. 
um, again, during my, my career um, and working in uh, private psychiatric types of facilities, there have been many times in which individuals have been restrained um, and various types of times out seclusions or physical restraints. Again, we tend to either physically restrain somebody or we chemically restrain individuals. How about this? What, what, what in the world could that be used for? So this was a hollow, hollow wheel. And so again, the idea is, is that if somebody was out of control, we could put them into this contraption for 36 to 48 hours and spin them around. And as a result of that, they would, again, possibly throw up, which would be a positive thing uh, because that would be, again, purging out the possible infection or the disease that was causing them to have mental illness. Um, and also it would calm them down because they would, again, have been so exhausted by being put into this type of apparatus. Finally, we moved into the 19th century and we started finally looking at some biological and societal issues that might be impacting individuals. Um, and so as a result of that, we, um, we started using techniques that were developed by Sigmund Freud um, and we started to provide treatment within asylums. Really what this did was create segregation in which we then were um, having people in institutions for long periods of time and separating them from, uh, from the community. Uh, and this is also the time in which they started the, uh, the lobotomies. So what is a lobotomy? Again, it's, it's hard to believe that people were using these types of techniques for individuals. And again, this is um, upsetting to me um, and it's concerning. Um, so again, if the, the content here becomes too much, it's okay to take a break or take care of yourself. But they used what was called the ice uh, pick type of lobotomy. And this was actually going on in our country from 1936 to 1950. Um, and so they would, again, believing that there was something going on within the, um, within the brain, and therefore, if you were puncturing that part of the brain, the person would calm down. Well, actually, what it did is created brain damage. Um, so the person did calm down because you were destroying parts of the brain that had an impact on behavior. Um, but this was seen as being uh, the technique um, or a, a medical procedure that would, um, again, it would change people's behavior, but it would also uh, do significant damage. Um, and less good. We also have moved into this type of strategy and it's actually still used today, but in a different way. So this is your ECT, or electroconvulsive shock therapy. And so the belief was, again, that if you shock the brain or have the brain go into some type of a seizure, that basically the brain would reset itself. Very similar to like rebooting your computer as an example. But the problem is, is that when it was originally done within the 1950s, and this was actually done to my grandmother when she was in the state psychiatric facility, Chattahoochee in Florida, you ended up shocking the entire brain and you scrambled the whole, the whole circuit. So she actually, when she left the hospital after eight years of being there, she actually had no previous memory of um, what happened before she got to the hospital. In today's time, it's still being used and you can get this treatment in our area. Um, they're using lower bolts and more specific shocks to specific parts of the brain. Many individuals will still struggle to be able to tell you the reason that it works or what the science is behind it. But again, it's usually being used now as kind of a last resort when uh, talk therapy and medication has not been helpful. So no single group of individuals has undergone more types of experimentation than what the mentally ill have within our state hospitals. And so we had over 18,000 uh, lobotomies from 1939 to 1951. That's a lot of individuals. It even happened to our president's uh, sister, the youngest Kennedy um, actually also had a lobotomy. And if you look at um, the impact on her life, um, again, it's, it's uh, quite tragic. Her name was Rose Mary or uh, Rose Marie or Rosemary Kennedy. Um, she actually died in 2005, but she has a, a very tragic story, but is a, 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 an example of how this was happening um, even within the presidential family. As a psychologist, when I was moving into the field, this was my face. I was, I was supposed to be a blank slate. 
have no emotions or expressions um, and just allow the person to project onto me and we had um, transference and counter-transference. But how many times have you faced a, a, someone who's supposed to be helping you and they are giving you, no matter how they feel, it's just a blank um, expression. And many individuals find that to not be helpful. So as a result of all of these types of attempts to be helpful, we have resulted in lawsuits. Um, there's four of them actually in North Carolina, um, going back to uh, William, Thomas S., the Olmstead Act, and now the Department of Justice. Uh, and so this was the Olmstead Act, that, again, where people's American with Disability uh, Act rights were being violated because they were being institutionalized for a long period of time and not moved into opportunities for housing within the community. And so we're still now dealing with those issues. In fact, our Department of Justice uh, settlement is related to violations of the Olmstead Act where individuals were in uh, adult congregate facilities and segregated from housing uh, and now are having opportunities to reintegrate into the uh, community. CMS, the Centers for Medicaid Medicare Services, um, has a summary about this ruling that says that when we are providing services, there must be inclusive environments around their home, their employment, and their services, and it must be done within a community-based setting. This is still in process. Um, we have made progress, but there's still definitely a long way to go. And then we're familiar with the Department of Justice settlement of which um, these states are involved and currently this is going on in North Carolina. This also is um, described with the acronym TCLI or Transitions to Community Living Initiative. Um, and all of the LMEMCOs like Alliance Health are now doing this in-reach effort to provide people with the opportunity to live in the community. The, the challenge is that once people get in the community, they have to have the social community inclusion part that helps them be able to be successful because uh, people need more than four walls. They need the connection um, and with the supports around them. SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Administration, has put together the On the Road to Recovery um, for Adult Mental Health. When we talk about systems of care, I'm talking about how we are um, able to work uh, across um, silos um, in order to uh, be able to access people's uh, care. Um, one moment, I need to change my lighting. So we have maybe providers on the call. So we have that service system. We have the Department of Public Health. We have social services. We have schools. We have churches. How do we work across those silos or across those institutions and agencies to ensure people don't fall between our agencies or fall into the cracks? That's a system of care. How uh, we all bring our resources together like we're doing today and have conversations about recovery and the recovery principles so that we're working off the same page um, because the individuals that we're serving are the same. We're serving the same individuals. And this is a part of being evidence-based and doing what works, what generates outcomes, and having it be in the community, having it be recovery-oriented, flexible, and helping people recognize um, their, their strengths, uh, and looking at how we can work together. So what, I, what I'd like to highlight here about recovery and our national reform effort is, is that this is not new. This started 20 years ago. The challenge that we have under the highlights at the bottom is that research to get into services can take 15 to 20 years. And so what we know works when it were, and, and to get it um, actually into services is a huge delay. Our society, I suggest to you, would not tolerate this on the medical side. If people had to wait for a vaccine or wait for a treatment or medication for 15 to 20 years, uh, that, would not, that would be unacceptable. Yet we have other types of behavioral health interventions that are not being implemented uh, for a long period of time. Under conclusions, the good news is, and many of you um, who are in long-term recovery know, it's real. The problem is the systems that we have to promote recovery many times hinder it and don't promote it, or again, the individuals that work within the systems are not on board. So why do we want recovery? Because our system is not always oriented to the hope of recovery. 
Uh, and we, and as a result of this, the, the care that people are getting may be poor or resources are being wasted on interventions that don't work. Uh, and we've lost opportunities for, for recovery. We want to support individuals to be able to move forward. I'm transitioning to another slide and I really like this portion. So um, uh, I hope this is helpful to you. But if you start looking at our medical model, this is the way in which we have been uh, providing services in the past where you go to the doctor, right? And you can see from the fourth bullet down, the doctor's in charge. And you really the focus is on what medicine you're going to get in order to help your signs and symptoms. Many times it's hospital-based. It's very much you're dependent on those providers. Um, and you basically are taught to be helpless or just basically do what the doctor says. And you don't always get a lot of input to the system. And this is also or into the care. Uh, you're dependent on them. That's the way it works. And this is the way we have uh, psychiatry has been for quite some time. So as a result of this maintenance or medical model, we basically just want to keep people at baseline um, and, do, and be concerned about anything that might create decompensation. Um, you really are just trying to reduce the symptoms, rely, stay on your medicine, reduce your stress, um, no risk, don't try to get a job, don't just stay, don't change your housing, just um, maybe go on disability, have a stable income, um, and just stay at your baseline. That's where we need to stay. I do challenge you as individuals to think about how many of us would like to be the same person you are today a year from now, two years from now, five years from now. Do you want to just stay the same or would you actually like to get better? Getting better um, includes hope and that's the recovery model and that includes all of these types of principles. Principles in which we have higher expectations for yourself where we're more so solution focused um, and looking at risks and benefits, I, I want to be able to make some mistakes and learn from them. I want to be included. I want to be empowered. I want to make my own decisions, self-determination. Um, and I want to really focus on being my best self and me being me. So maybe this is what you, you want your life to look like. And for the people that we serve, which is that we have plateaus, but then we have some distress. We have some difficult times and we're in that right now related to COVID. But how do we, uh, what doesn't kill us makes us stronger, how do we use those experiences then to move to the next uh, plateau? One thing we have to do is really focus on the whole person. Focusing on the whole person is mind, body, and our spiritual health so that we are like a triangle or a three-legged stool and have balance in our life and be able to move through difficult times to be able to move um, to the next level. Um, and so then this is really what the recovery is. So it's not really about maintenance or stability. So why should we even care about recovery? Why is that even important? Well, we have five major groups that hopefully can see why recovery is important to them. We have the people that we're serving. And again, I don't call them clients. I don't call them consumers. I don't call them uh, patients. They are people, people with challenges related to mental health or substance use. We all have challenges. We're more the same than we are different. And then there's the families and the supports around them. We also have providers who are paid, provide uh, paid services. We have oversight agencies like Alliance Health, the MCOs, and we of course answer them to our state federal uh, funders. And then we also have the community at large. So we start looking at the research and why individuals um, uh, want to be um, concerned about this is because people who are receiving services would like to live their best life and there's things in their life that they would like to be able to accomplish. Uh, and their family members want to support them to be independent. Uh, providers like to see people get better. Um, and so it's encouraging. We got into this field because we wanted to help people. Uh, we care, we have a high amount of empathy and we wanna be able to see people um, move, move forward in their lives. Um, the payers of services, um, like the health management organizations, MCO, they are interested in having people do more natural supports um, and, and again, be able to contain costs while also maintaining a high level of quality. And our state and federal governments is looking at how can they best use the money for the best outcomes. So we all have a vital role in being able to move uh, people forward um, and their mental health. If I had to redo this slide, I would, uh, okay, we have substance use. We, real important that we've moved forward with terminology and recovery language and use words like substance use, not substance abuse. So 
Why should we care? Here's five reasons. We don't want any more lawsuits. That's a, um, it, that again, create where people's rights have been violated. We know that recovery is real. We wanna help people move forward with that. Uh, we really wanna be about transforming the individuals, not having them just conform to the rules. Um, and it's expensive to invest in maintenance or the medical model. Um, and we really, again, want to help advance um, the, the plan, mission, and vision that we all have. So can we afford to not do recovery? And the answer is no, we cannot really afford not to do that. That really has to be our service delivery system. Here's my next topic. Let's talk about what is patienthood and how we have, especially as we started looking back at the um, 1900s, 1950s, and the uh, medical model. Medical model is kind of set up on there's a doctor and there's a patient. And what is the role of that patient? It basically can be self-stigmatizing. In other words, I'm a patient. In other words, it takes away from me being an individual. Um, and if I'm a patient, then what, how do I spend my time? And who's in control of my life and my, med and my decisions? Um, and how does that impact the way that I think about myself? So the Within a patient um, means that I would take medicine. I'm looking at what's wrong with me. More importantly, I would really encourage you to, as a trauma-informed uh, community to really look at what happened to people and not what's wrong with people. Within the patient um, model, model, I really don't have a lot of voice or choice because I'm basically doing what the doctor says um, because I'm not capable. Um, and this creates um, alienation and me separate, separating from others. I end up looking very different. I think that I look different from others, and it results in more forced treatment. Um, being a medical, medical mental patient can also result in being stigmatized, ostracized, socialized to behave in a certain way, being talked down to, um, and otherwise being treated um, and to think that I don't matter or that I am a label, which is my diagnosis, um, and that's just not helpful. So when I am in this patient role, um, over time, um, through provider after provider and service after service, I can really develop a very negative sense of myself. I end up believing what people say about me. I end up believing what neighbors and what um, bullies will say about me in, in the community. And so I end up developing a very negative sense of self. I mean, wouldn't you? I mean, if all these people are saying this, then I, it must be true. Um, and so then I also can then really lack in my sense of meaning and my own purpose because I feel very hopeless and very helpless because no matter what I do, it doesn't seem to really make a difference. And that becomes who I am. Many times people again um, think that they are their diagnosis and really want to encourage person first language. I'm a person with um, whatever the condition might be. I'm a uh, I'm a man who also happens to be a father and a son, and previously I was a student. So all of these roles, we have multifacets, but we are not our disability. Um, that is just a list of symptoms that help describe some of the challenges that I am. So we end up having to further explore, again, um, uh, who am I and what is my identity? And this really times is based on your beliefs, your wants, things that you like and things that you value. Um, and your life. But if I buy into all of the patienthood identity, these um, bullets are what happens um, to how I end up feeling about myself, and this has an impact on my self-esteem, and this is not going to promote more recovery. Um, and it's going to make it even more challenging to deal with the challenges that I have around mental health and substance use disorders. And so there is stigma, and this is one of the major barriers to people getting help, being judged by others as a mark of disgrace or shame, um, which will set somebody apart from others. It always makes me think about, again, going back to the prehistoric times and looking at when we had tribes and groups, you had to stick with the pack or stay in the middle of the pack to be safe. If you got pushed out of the pack, then you were at risk to being um, to nature and to other animals. And so we're, um, when people get pushed aside, discriminated against, segregated against, then this creates some of the um, challenges that people have. My lighting has changed again. My, the, in my room here, if I uh, move, the, the lights come on. One moment.
I'll have to find a way to be animated, but be still. <laughs> All right. So if everyone, is, again, is stigmatizing me, then I end up stigmatizing myself because I end up seeing myself as being more different uh, than the same. So let's talk about uh, words that begin with D that will define individuals. So first of all, I am a person, but I'm facing difficulties and disappointments. And this can also result in distress. And this can cover up or hamper some of myself. Sometimes, I don't know about you, but it feels like there's a black cloud over me. And I know some people, it seems like there's always a, a black cloud that seems to be following them. One challenge after another seems that they just have difficulty getting a break. As a result of that, on top of that, then I may start experiencing anxiety and depression. One out of five individuals each year experience serious, um, some type of mental health condition related to anxiety and depression. And so I end up getting a diagnosis. And I start thinking I'm an anxious person or I'm a depressed person. The, the next thing that will end up happening is that I will, on top of that, I think that uh, I must have a disease. We end up using the disease model many times to uh, explain um, substance use disorders. And then I become disabled um, and I get a disability check. And this further defines who I am and I really see myself as being more deficit-based than anything else. And then as a result of this, I feel disempowered or disenfranchised. Um, and uh, demoralized and dysfunctional. Who doesn't have a dysfunctional family? Um, there's a little dysfunction in all families and we all have an Uncle Bill, an Aunt Sue or someone in our family that has some amount of dysfunction. But again, we end up thinking that we're the only ones or that it's only happening in our family and that we are a dysfunctional family or a dysfunction, therefore a dysfunctional individual. And so as a result of these types of labels and words that begin with the letter D, the individual disappears. And these messages that people have can be life altering, spirit breaking, identity shattering, hope diminishing, soul crushing, perceptions of reality. And as clinicians, we may have the illusions that, you know what, um, you don't know who I serve. You, you don't know how difficult the people are the, um, the, the people, and how recovery might be difficult for them. Um, and, and how, again, they may not be able to move towards uh, employment or uh, living on their own. And that may be true. But many times what is contributing to people not seeing recovery as a possibility is outdated attitudes or a lack of knowledge based on current research. Many times they are, uh, individuals have low expectations of other people, thinking that they can't work. Um, and many of these disincentives for employment will keep people sick. We also, it may not be the individual, but it's more of the system is set up to just create stabilization and maintenance. Um, and again, with some of our approaches, uh, we don't, are not using evidence-based approaches that keep people stuck in their patienthood model. And so the focus many times can be just on, on adding more services rather than adding what might work. Um, and, look, and we need to start looking at ways we can uh, start funding best practices um, and really also value people's lived experience and knowing that the, uh, the experiences that have accumulated over life also has, a, has an impact uh, and have value. So where did recovery come from? Well, it is um, no longer, again, viewing oneself as a, as a mental patient, but looking at a positive sense of self. It's letting go of those old ideas, embracing new ones. And rather than focusing on should have, could haves, and other fear-based mentality, I accept me as me. In other words, I am worth it. I can move forward. I am who I am. I know where I've been. I know how I got there. And, I, and how to forgive, uh, forget and forgive and be able to move forward no matter what. These are the positive statements. So here's another um, example of what uh, recovery is not. So know that it's not about stabilization, functioning, and maintenance. We're gonna move away from terms like high functioning and low functioning and just talk about how people manage their life. We know that recovery is not an exception. It's just not like a few people get it and other people don't. Everybody has their own recovery experience. 
It is not about compliance. Compliance is just about following the rules. I don't always follow the rules. Sometimes it's not always um, black and white and we wanna be able to see some gray. Um, and some people, uh, part, of, part of compliance is that gets in the way of innovation. In other words, sometimes we need to challenge uh, the way things have been done before and look at something new. There's not a set formula. There's many paths of recovery. Everyone has their own path and their own process. And how do we support everyone in their own journey? And it's not something I can do for you. It's something I want to do with you, that we can do it together. Um, and, and that's going to require me to ask you what is most helpful. What do you need now? Not me sitting behind the desk saying, here's what you need to do. And it's not just me being nice or us being nice to other people. We definitely need more kindness in the world, but we're also talking about how we can have these crucial conversations with individuals to help them get the information they need. And, and we're not just trying to cure or remove signs and symptoms of their disorder. So we really want to get back to um, the basics, really, and what, what individuals that you are serving or what people in long-term recovery want is really, we're human. We're all together in this together. And so guess what they want? They want what you want. They want meaningful contributions. I was hoping that I get onto this call today with the spiritual training and that I say something that makes a difference for one person, wanting to know that I've contributed. Many times when I was helping people in the past find jobs, it was all related to the four F's. They were finding a job related to food, flowers, filth, or factories. Food was like fast, syrup, fast food. Flowers was uh, landscaping, mowing the grass. Filth was housekeeping. And factories was piecework. If people want to do that kind of work, great. But we really want to open up opportunities that people get to do what they dream, what they are passionate about. People that we serve and that um, like you, I want to be loved. I don't know about you, but I want to be able to have friendship, companionship, and intimacy. Yes, and so to be direct, I'm also talking about sex. Individuals want to have both emotional and sexual intimacy to be able to connect it. They want to have relationships uh, and have the ability to choose with whom they need to be, uh, with who they want to be with. They also want to have value that they, again, are contributing and a lot of people want safety. Uh, safe, affordable housing is a huge issue. Housing is a therapeutic intervention and that's one way in which we need to be able to help individuals um, around personal control. There's two more. Um, we want to make choice. When we did mental health reform back in 2001, we privatized the services so people had a choice of who their provider is. So if they don't like one, they can get another. We want choice, but they also want to have choice about when I go to bed and when I eat and sleeping in on weekends, which a lot of people in group homes may or may not get. And one of the primary pieces of recovery is hope. Well, leaving that my life can be better. It's in crucial times around COVID, how important it is that people will have hope that a vaccine is coming, that things are getting better, um, and that we will survive this pandemic together. Um, and so that creates uh, the hope that we're in recovery now um, and that it will not always be this difficult. And most importantly, again, going back to a home, it's not a placement, a slot, or just not housing. It's really a home, a place where I feel connected to other individuals. All right, I'm moving on to the next topic here, which is about where did recovery come from? And there's a, a variety of people um, and his, historical uh, events that have moved us forward um, in, the re in the recovery process. And I'll be more than happy to share the slides with you. And this one here allows you to kind of look at each of these um, uh, transitions. I'll just highlight one for you, uh, which would be 1949, the Fountain House model. This is our psychosocial rehabs um, or clubhouse models, um, the PSR programs. Uh, started back in 1949, where people who, again, had similar life experiences could come together and support each other on a daily basis. Um, and the reasons why a lot of the recovery came about is because of there was an overuse of medication, not a lot of choice, more force, and more focus on deficit and diagnosis. This still, again, can be happening today. We've made some progress, and we still have a ways to go. Um, there's several individuals I would highlight that are also worth your read and further research or Google would be to Google Pat Deegan uh, to look at Dr. William Anthony. You also um, could also look at doc, uh, 
Dr. Dan Fisher and Mary Ellen Copeland. She's the one I'm most familiar with because of RAP, W-R-A-P, Wellness Recovery Action Plans. I have a RAP plan. I encourage everyone to have a RAP plan that looks at how do you stay well. Uh, this is more about wellness, not necessarily always being happy or feeling good, but how do I stay well at both, again, mind, body, and spirit to keep myself in that balanced place so that I don't become sick. As we start looking at the recovery-oriented system of care, uh, we need to include all of these pieces to ensure that our system as a whole is working together. And that means we have to work, reach out and connect with people across other systems. Just like people are in recovery, systems can be in recovery too. So if we look at the past, people had illnesses and they had relapse. Even though relapse is part of uh, the change model for substance use disorders. We currently are looking at people just being stable or maintenance, but really I hope you'll help us move forward into more of people recovering and actually uh, thriving. Systems have been in the past very traditional and possibly antiquated. Um, we keep doing the same old things, expecting different results. Um, and it was just business as usual. We're very much stuck into what is a fee for service type of uh, format. No matter what the service is, you bill in 15 minute increments and that's it. But really, really what we want to do is pay for performance and look at outcomes and how do we ensure that people have innovation and that people are actually progressing and getting well. SAMHSA has a lot of opportunities for us to explore that further. Um, and you can go to the Recovery to Practice a website, which gives you lots of resources for behavioral health professionals. And so we all have a piece of this to come together because if we do the right at a combination of both attitudes and supports, people can fully recover, not partially recover, fully recover from mental illness. Uh, and Dan Fisher is an example of an individual uh, who was on medication in the past and worked with his doctor in order to get off that medication and be able to manage his, uh, his life on his own using a variety of other supports. Again, it's an individual process. Some people need to stay on their medicines. Um, and only work with their doctor to transition off. It just really depends on a case-by-case -case basis. But what's the most important again is believing and knowing that people, um, some people do fully recover. So these are the guiding principles to a uh, person-driven. Again, choice of words is really important. This is not person-centered, but person-driven. In other words, they are driving the car. I am not that nagging backseat driver. I am there to support person um, as a passenger, as their guest. And they get to decide whether I am the car or not, but they're driving the model. And we need policies that support that. We need training that supports that, along with goals and services uh, to help people move forward. And we also, of course, need to evaluate the recovery models that are being used. This slide is really important for our providers because it talks about a research project that was done in 1996 with over 250 individuals in Ohio and Maine and there are strengths listed. This is what people want from you. If you'd like to be an excellent service provider, these are what the people that were served, the people that you're serving now, what they're asking for. They're asking you to encourage their independent thinking. They're asking you to treat them in a way that helps them support their recovery. They wanna be treated as an equal. Uh, again, another training or more research is, uh, around the topic uh, is called shared decision making. I want to have freedom to make my own mistakes. I made mistakes, I bet you did too. Hopefully we learn from them, but at least I had what's called the dignity of risk. I had the dignity, you gave me the dignity to at least let me risk, to at least let me try and didn't try to hold me back. You were able, you listened to me, people want to be heard. You were able to recognize my ability and looked at some of my strengths. Um, you worked with me to find next steps in my research and, and my opportunities. You didn't tell me that I was crazy to have these ideas and these dreams. You supported me and you told, gave me information about my medication. All of these things are what people want. They want somebody to talk to. We're supporting a shift from patient to person. These people, uh, again, so we're more, uh, and these involve inter uh, environmental and also um, societal supports. So now I'm going to give you five things that you can do in order to move forward in the recovery model, both for yourself, for the people that you love, and the people that you serve, or for your neighbors and friends. 
Number one is empathy and awareness. In Mental Health First Aid, we talk about non-judgmental listening, uh, which is really about empathy. And this is your ability to put yourself in the shoes of someone else. I encourage you to look at a YouTube video called Empathy by Brene Brown. And it's very helpful to look at how you can be uh, in someone else's um, shoes. Um, because a lot of uh, individuals that we're serving, 90% of them have experienced some type of trauma. This is why I started out with the Hope for North Carolina uh, 1-800 number because the COVID is traumatizing to individuals. Uh, and we want to make sure that we are getting people the support, connection, and information that they need uh, to deal with this pandemic. So I'm going to read this to you. Um, if you were in my class, I would tell you to repeat the part, or maybe you can do it in your head, called On the Other Side of the Desk. So here we go. Have you ever thought a wee little bit about how you would seem or how it would feel to be a misfit? And have you ever felt uh, what it would be like if you had to sit on the other side of the desk. Have you ever looked at a man who seemed a bum as he or she sat before you nervous and dumb and thought about the courage that it took for them to come to the other side of the desk? Have you ever thought to yourself about that person's dreams that went astray, the hard real facts of their every day and the things in their lives that made them stay on the other side of the desk? And have you ever thought to yourself, oh, it could be I, if the good things in life had passed me by, and maybe I might even bluster, and I could even lie from the other side of the desk. Did you make that person feel that they were full of greed, or make them ashamed of their race or creed, or did you reach out to them in need from your other side of your desk? May God give us wisdom, and lots of it, and much compassion, and plenty of grit, so that we may be kinder to those who sit on the other side of the desk anonymous. We never know when we're going to be on the other side of the desk. It could happen to any of us. Again, in our current environment related to COVID, uh, individuals become positive or have exposures every day. Um, how are we going to reach out and be um, supportive to those individuals? Um, one in five individuals end up developing a mental health condition. It could be you or I. Um, we never know. Trauma and life changes uh, quite quickly. Here's the second thing you can do. The second thing you can do is change your language. Have recovery-based language. This is more about being person-centered, but this is a way to get rid of the stigma and some of the misperceptions. So I encourage you, that last sentence in the first paragraph, people with mental health issues are not crazy, lunatics, or nuts. So please stop using those words. We end up using the words crazy. That's crazy, girl, you're crazy. The cr traffic was crazy. Again, those uh, that word just further the stigma. You can also be an advocate. So if you see something, you can say something. Remember 9-11, you can speak up and be a voice for people when you see people using these types of language that perpetuates the, the stigma around mental health. So we're gonna emphasize the person, look at their strengths, promote hope, um, and help people work on the challenges and the needs that they have. These are the words that would inspire uh, recovery and move us from personhood um, and person-first language. Again, on the medical side, medical models on the left and the recovery languages on the right. Number three, this is a really important topic around giving up power and control um, and about partnerships that would need to occur, be, uh, needs to occur because essentially help that isn't helpful is not very helpful. Um, it actually can do harm. So we need to stop. And we need to ask somebody, is this really helpful? People will bring you know, food uh, to try to be helpful, but they, people don't like that food. Um, so maybe they don't need food. Maybe they need um, someone to talk to them. They need someone to listen. And so we really need to talk about how there are power differentials um, and how there can be oppressive power that occurs. And this goes from either neglectful help where people don't really care and they don't get involved at all, versus toxic help where they help too much. Um, and how do we get that into, uh, into a middle part where help can be really be, uh, be helpful. Um, and in power, um, uh, there's a, another concept about a power and control wheel. It's used a lot in domestic violence. Um, if you look at this list, these are all things where power can be used um, over individuals. 
Um, and so again, we really want to look at what your role is um, and ensure that we have uh, everyone is feeling equal on the same page uh, at the same level and making sure that we don't ab abuse any kind of a power that you might have. Um, and that takes some awareness. Uh, first of all, acknowledging that you have the power and then, and then using it effectively to be able to help others. Um, the fourth concept here is about recovery knowledge. It's about educating yourself and knowing about local trainings and opportunities. It's also spending some time looking at SAMHSA and the dimensions of wellness, which is related to recovery. When you look at, um, and looking at the whole person related to emotional, financial, social, spiritual, occupational, physical, intellectual, and environmental. All of those components and taking the time to really explore each of those various um, circles of one's, one's life. And we also know what moves us forward is peer support. Individuals who have been there, done that, who have that lived experience can be more valuable than someone with a degree like myself who have never been there. So we look, we need all those people on our team and I'm grateful that the Department of Mental Health and our state has recognized the importance of peer support and have incorporated them into some of our service delivery systems. Um, and sometimes these also come in the form of your support groups. Um, peer support groups um, actually happen through NAMI. And so there's a variety of ways in which you can connect with peers and people who have that similar life experience. Due to the sake of time, I won't read this one, but if you watch that Brene Brown video that I mentioned, this is about where someone falls into a hole and how a peer support specialist goes down in the hole with them. And they go down in the hole with them because they've been there before and they know how to get out. Um, and so many times people need that kind of constant support as they're moving forward. The last part, which is equally uh, important or most important is employment. And we know that the unemployment rate for people with disabilities can be up to 85%. And yet um, a large percentage of individuals say, 75% of them say that they want to work. Um, but yet we uh, have not always provided that opportunity. Um, next steps is um, us continuing this conversation, looking at what your role is, and, and then looking at um, what you need to start doing, what you need to stop doing, and then how can we continue to move forward with that. Uh, I'll go ahead. That's the um, last slide in the um, presentation. So I'm now looking at our um, uh, a chat function here, and I'll answer the questions as they come up. Um, uh, Daryl wanted to let everybody know this was a great training, good information. I'm glad. I um, have a great rest of the work week and a nice long weekend. I could not agree with you more. Um, other other questions that you would have, or things that you would like to share. Okay, I see that. Uh, Diana, thank you. Um, she says, thank you, and um, great information. This, um, another thank you. Also want, um, if you would like to unmute and also share anything that way, we definitely can have a conversation that way also, if you'd like to um, uh, unmute yourself. Hi, this, this was a great presentation. I was wondering, can you share the name of the, um, the link again for the video about empathy? Oh, sure, sure. Um, it is by Brene Brown. Um, Brene Brown is a much better psychologist than me. Uh, she has wonderful books and YouTubes and TED Talks. And so if you go to YouTube and type in Brene, B-R-E-N-E -E Brown, she has several different videos that out there are helpful. One of which is on empathy, which I really like, which is goes along with that story about being down in the hole when people kind of get hit a difficult spot. But a second one that complements it well is about blame. And how often we want to blame the person. 
You know, how many times has that happened when somebody has a relapse in substance use and they say, oh, well, it's their fault. They weren't working their program. They weren't committed to their recovery. Um, and so we want to blame the individual uh, for what happens, which really is just a way of us discharging our frustration and anger uh, versus looking at the challenges that people have around um, managing their lives. So empathy and blame go together. I would suggest to you, as Brene does, that it's very difficult for you to have empathy for individuals that you're blaming. If you think it's their own fault, then you're not going to have much empathy for them because basically you would say they made their bed, they need to lie in it. Um, so looking at ways in which we can blame people less um, and have increase our empathy. Brene Brown is the, uh, the presenter or the, um, she actually is a researcher around social work has been very helpful to me uh, personally and professionally. Thank you for the question. Thank you. My pleasure. Anyone else like to, um, other comments that you'd like to share? Okay. I'm also in the chat here. I'm going to um, go ahead and put my email address in here also. So that if you have other questions um, or if you'd like this training to be provided again or you have another group that you would like this to provide this training to, we would be happy to do so. Again, my name is uh, James Osborne, uh, J as in James, my last name Osborne at AllianceHealthPlan.org. So we'd be happy to, to virtually provide this training to anyone. Um, and yes, I'll be able to send out the slides um, to everyone. I definitely will do that. Um, and I'll have your uh, registrations in order to send that email out. Uh, also, individuals like to have a certificate, so I'll also um, send that to you also. Um, but Alliance Health has a lot of um, free tra trainings. Please check out our, um, our website under member trainings. There's a, a different training every week. Um, moving forward in the coming months. Um, and again, if you have other groups that would uh, like to have the training, we would be happy to also talk with them. No group is too small or, or too large. Anything else for um, I end for the day? All right, well, again, um, I'm just really, I'm grateful for your time. I'm grateful for your commitment to recovery and the hope that you bring to yourself and others every day. Uh, please continue uh, in that journey and let us know how we can help you uh, move forward uh, as we get through this difficult time together. So I hope you enjoy the rest of your day, week, and um, long holiday weekend. Um, thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure.